Thank you again for being here, and I would love to introduce my colleague, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who is Atlantic Senior Editor. He will be here for a conversation with author and restaurateur Eddie Wong, and a special congratulations to ta Just last week, he was the winner of the National Magazine Award for his essay, Fear of a Black President. Thank you. Wow, um, this is uh, such a great event. I have uh, moderated events for The Atlantic uh, going on five years now. And this is the first time I've done an interview with a fellow hip hop head. <laughs> the Atlantic is getting really edgy here. Really, really edgy here. We actually walked out on stage with mics. I mean, we could have done the whole thing. Was really play. good, Upper West Side. Right, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So it's going to be like really hard for me not to take up this next 30 minutes talking about Kendrick Lamar or Eddie's <laughs> five favorite hip-hop albums of all time, but I'm going to try not to do that. Um, <clears throat> Eddie has a book, and his book is called uh, Fresh Off the Boat. And I'm halfway through the book. I'm not even going to front like I read the whole <laughs> thing. Um, we got confirmed on Sunday. Um, but we do share, uh, as crazy as this is, we do share the same book out of the Chris Jackson. Sure. So I'm very familiar with that. He's very familiar with the themes he was working on and what he was working out in there. Um, there's a lot that I related to in the book, uh, actually. And the, the place I want to start this off is, for me, like as a young African-American, coming up in the 80s and the 90s, I felt like I really didn't have much choice in terms of like whether to identify with hip-hop or not. Like, it was the language, yeah. and either you spoke the language or you didn't. And I wonder, whenever I, quite frankly, uh, talk to folks who get into hip-hop who are not African-American, who obviously had a different choice, um, what was it that drew you to the culture? You're obviously strongly hip-hop identified in your writing, maybe even in your cooking. Maybe you yeah. even go that far to say. Um, what, what drew you to the culture? You know, I, I think it's actually even... Very interesting to me, I was looking at the program and it said like race, the new New York and America and, and then I have my name and I rarely see conversations about race where it's like an Asian person that's, that's speaking. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me, my experience in America growing up, it was black and white, especially in the 80s, especially in the 90s. It was not a brown, yellow, black, white, purple situation. It was black and white. And so I also saw a lot of, I remember I told Chris, just the honest answer, people asked me, like, when was it that you felt like a kindred spirit to black culture? And the first time it happened was I was in Magruder's in, like, northern Virginia, D.C., in the grocery store. And I would always, like, touch the fruit because my mom, when we pick out pineapples or mangoes, you smell the bottom by, by the stem and you look for, like, the syrup and you, you smell for it. And sometimes I get a little excited and, like, kind of pinch the mango to see if the flesh was soft. And my mom would always smack me. And I remember seeing, uh, yeah, and I remember seeing I know where this, is going. Yeah, this black kid and he was pinching the grapes and his mom smacked him upside the head, too. And I was like, what's up, brother? <laughs> and that was it for me. It was at the produce aisle in the, in the grocery store. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Right. Definitely a culture of mobility there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm very, very, very familiar with that. You know, one of the things, you know, that, that I noticed in the memoir is there's this undercurrent of violence in the book, you know, you talk about some of the stuff that happened in your house. You talk about your own behavior in school. And again, like, I really related to that point, you know, coming up in the crack era, uh, you know, homicide rates, you know, really, really off the charts in my hometown of Baltimore and cities around the country. And hip hop really, you know, being something that addressed that reality, pulled from that reality. Yet I wonder, like, in some of your uh, hijinks, at one point, Eddie makes a slingshot out of spam. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, shoots it at people. It looked like yeah. a lot of fun. I wish I had been there. Um, I would have totally been into that. Um, but in my mind was this sort of concern always as a child that, like, the sort of behavior I was indulging in might well get me killed. It might well lead to jail. And I wonder if you, you had that in, in your background at all. The thing, the thing for me is I think there's a big misunderstanding about hip-hop and that culture, right? I, I was drawn to it and I felt a similarity to it because 
I grew up in a home where my parents beat me, right? And I talk about it a lot in the book, and nobody needs to feel sad or awkward. Like, that's, that's what happens in an immigrant home in a lot of times. I'm not co-signing that. I think it's wrong. But um, the thing is, is that when I heard Pac talking about these things, and I heard all this music that at many times was laced with violence, I, I was a little desensitized towards it. It didn't put me off. It was not like a barrier to my entry. So I would listen. I wasn't listening for the violence, though, because I think hip-hop is much deeper. But when that's what you grow up with, parents hitting you and things like that, that's part of your DNA and fabric, whether you like it or not. And a lot of people ask me, would you do it different? And I said, yeah, I, I won't hit my kids like my father beat me, right? But... It also, they asked me, would you be the same person that you are? And I say, absolutely not. Mm. I rem and, and this is the gift and the curse. And I have to be honest about it. I do not encourage people hitting their children, but I absolutely would not be the same person. My father owned a steakhouse. And I remember this bartender that worked for him. And he would always ask me, your dad loves the magic, but you cheer for everybody that plays against the magic every time you and your pops sit here and watch mm. this game. Mm. And I said, why? I said, I don't know. I just cheer against my dad. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't until even like after the book came out a couple months ago, I started to realize that I always, because my father beat me, I wanted to beat him, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so people would say, why wasn't it that, why didn't you become a, a cook or a restaurant owner early on? You grew up in restaurants. Mm -hmm. And my thing is because that's what my pops did. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do the same thing as him. So I went like all these circuitous routes, whether it was stand-up comedy, streetwear, hip-hop. Um, I went, I got a law degree, passed the bar at one point. But in the end, food was what I loved. That's what I grew up with. And, and in, in a way, I wouldn't let my pops take that from me. Yeah. But um, we, got, we on good terms. We cool. You raised something that was really, really important to me. Um, and that is, like, it, it made me wonder whether, like, if you grow up in a, I wouldn't even say a home, but a culture suffused with violence. Yeah. Like, I always tell people, I learned to swim by being thrown into the deep end. <laughs> you, know, all, yeah. you know, so many of the lessons of my life came through violence. And so when you hear music where violence is a, is a big part of it, I mean, you just said it. You can almost look right past it. It's your life. You and, know? and also, it makes you feel less weird. Right, right, right. right because right. even if it's wrong and you don't like it, it's like, right. all right, well, at least he's having the same experience. Right, right, right. And I wonder if that's one of the things, one of the reasons why there's always been this sort of oppositional pose between America and the music, even as it becomes the pop music of America. Yeah, it's, it's really in opposition to uh, immigrant culture, mm. I feel, in a lot of ways, because mm. I... I don't, I don't think that we fully understand the culture of immigrants. I think we're very under, we consume the culture of immigrants. We, um, we, we try to be politically correct and legislate mm -hmm. to protect the culture of immigrants, but do we truly understand it? Do we really live amongst each other? I don't think we're at that phase yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Obama being elected is fantastic, but I think a lot of people were very eager to see America as post-racial, mm -hmm. and I don't... I don't see that, mm -hmm. nor do I see the globe as post-racial. You talked earlier about how, to you, uh, discussions of race mostly focus on black and white. Yeah. Just a dumb question. Did you feel left out? Do you feel left out? Yeah, I felt very left out. Mm -hmm. But as funny as it sounds, it was little, little, th the smallest things that people may not even realize were the biggest things to Asian people like myself. I remember watching Barry Gordy, The Last Dragon. Right, and of course. Like, I related to that. I related to show enough. That was martial arts. That's mm -hmm. what we were involved in. When you saw Black Panthers, brothers in Harlem wearing cotton kung fu shoes, like right. that was it. And, and of course, the biggest one was in seventh grade. I remember this, this Indian kid was driving me to school and he puts Wu-Tang 36 Chambers into the tape deck of his car. Mm -hmm. And you just heard those drops from the Shaw Brothers movies. And right. that changed my life. Because right. I was like, somebody else fucks with us besides us. Right. Right. Somebody else appreciates this culture and sees value in it besides me, my parents, and our community. And, and that was very special to me. So I felt like at least with Kung Fu, people really were about it. So the interesting thing about that to me is, you know, obviously I was a huge Wu-Tang fan, but I actually always worried that like, oh, these cats ain't never really been to China. Are we essentializing yeah. somebody else's culture? Like, is it like, you know, you know, some guy in Sweden making uh, like a rock band around the culture of like blackface or something yeah, like no, that. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Like when you see Riz's movie, like Man with the Iron Fist, right. I believe is the name of it. I saw it. It's, you're just like, damn, <laughs> man. <laughs> you should get back in the studio. But right, right, um, right. <laughs> I, I think the intent with Riz and those cats is very real. Mm -hmm. It's very real. The intent is real. And there's a real 
genuine appreciation and an attempt to understand. Right. And um, you hear, I hear, I've heard Jizza perform live, and I've seen him, you know, talk about the philosophy of Wu Tang, and mm -hmm. and and Wu is the, the the tongue, and and the wind is the sword, and mm -hmm. so they're very into the like Eastern philosophy. Um, you, I also thought that food was one of those things that Americans consumed, and it was a gateway into our culture. And that's actually why I decided to cook. Right. For a while, I, I would not cook because even though I knew I was good at it and people would come to my crib and they loved when I did 12 dishes for Chinese New Year, I'd cook and throw karaoke parties or whatever, um, I didn't want that to be my job because it was so stereotypical to me. Hmm. But then I finally realized in, in, a, in a, I believe it was Booker T. Washington, like cast down your bucket sort of right. a way. Right. I cast my bucket down in the restaurant and... I did it because I knew people wanted my pork buns paused, like they like they wanted the food. That sounded really dirty. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, like that. I knew that that's they would come for that, right? But right. I really just like any bill that's passed in the legislature, I had mad attachments to it. Like you were gonna come listen to the music I listened to. We were gonna dress the way we dress. Right. We were gonna we were gonna serve you the food the way we serve it, and and hire the the staff that we had, and so. In a funny way, we we tackled race relations through through a sandwich, mm -hmm. through a four dollar mm -hmm. sandwich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, has your dad been to your restaurant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My I parents like come. That. They were really upset that I did it early on because I was an attorney and quit, right. and that was just <laughs> they couldn't understand did they see it. They it like a downgrade. A yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, yeah. They saw it as a downward assimilation, uh -huh. and even even the Taiwanese newspapers and Chinese television stations, they still come all the time to the restaurant. And the first question is, are your parents still mad? Mm. And and mm. do you want to still be a lawyer? Like they can't get their head around it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's super hilarious yeah. to me because they can't see that like the work we're doing culturally in terms of Asian identity and and just immigrant identity in America, like, right. which is why I called the book Fresh Off the Boat, because right. I think people can relate to that. Is it because, like, do they see it as unstable? Like, not, like, like you know, if you're a lawyer, you get a salary, you do this, it's obvious, it has a certain status in America, you know, you buy a nice house, have kids, blah, blah, blah. Do they, is, it, is it that? They see it as work with your hands, physical, ah, manual right, work. Right, they don't right. see it as intellectual work, right. just like how, you know, you know, you see players playing basketball or football, you want them to be in a coaching position. Right. My right. parents don't see me as a coach, they see me as a player. I understand, yeah. I understand. When you were, when you were young, uh, you know, you talk a lot about, uh, in the book, you know, being in the comics, being in the wrestling, yeah. I mean, hip hop, I felt like you were writing right for me. <laughs> you know, Razor Ramon and yeah. all of that. Yeah, yeah, WWF was like WWF, the racial crucible right. of America it Saturday was. morning. There's some yeah. deep stuff going on. Yeah. They don't, the crowd don't even realize, you yeah. know, they don't even know. Yep. <laughs> Um, what was culture for you when you were a kid? Was it those things? Was that what you have said? This is what culture and art is for me? Yeah, you know, um, and I talk about academic syntax sometimes. We, we chose to write the book in my voice, the way I talk to my friends, the way I talk to my family. We, we chose to do that because so many books, it's almost like you go to write... You, 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 you embark on a literary endeavor and you expect, okay, now I gotta use a semicolon, I gotta have complex sentences, I gotta use SAT words. And, <laughs> and I was like, no, like, I've cleaned myself up. I've been in situations for 30 years of my life where I had to go business casual or, or I had to have my hair a certain way. I, they made me take the part out of my hair when I was at a law firm. And I was like, you know what? This is my story. This is my memoir. If there's one thing in this world that's mine, it's this book. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, it's Joel Santana from me to you. Right, right, you know? right, right. And, and so I chose to, to not change my language, but then... Um, I'm sorry, the question you had, I lost my train of thought. It's, right. it's okay, it's all right. Bad. I was asking you whether, like, what culture was to you. But let me, you know, oh, yeah, so culture, okay, that's what I was getting to. My fault <laughs> is, that, right. is that there are certain cultures that you're expected to know and you're expected to quote in certain situations. Right. My thing was I always wanted to flip it on people. I wanted to talk about the clash of civilizations but using examples of the WWF as opposed to, like, the Middle East, right? right? right. And, and I felt that there was room for a common person like myself who just sees these concepts and theories at work. Because I went to college and I saw it, but I was like, you're making it too complicated. Right. This is as simple as Hulk Hogan versus the Iron Sheik. Right, right, right. No, it's, it's interesting because I yeah. think like, I mean, I hate Or Rocky IV, uh, you know, like that's the Cold War. I, I hate to, you know, put you on the spot with this, but it's like, it's an interesting connection here. Uh, Eddie, uh, 
I don't know if he's most famous for this, but he definitely, uh, when people talk about Eddie, they talk about his review of uh, Marcus Samuelson's restaurant yep. uh, up in Harlem, uh, Red Rooster. And it was interesting because I was reading through that piece, and to be honest, like a lot of times, I don't, you know, it had been presented to me as a takedown, and I'm always like, ah, I don't know about that. Yeah. I mean, but what I really, really liked about the piece, actually, and what I can tell, you know, just from talking to you, is that you have a very, I don't even want to call it a pop sensibility of art, but a grassroots sensibility of what art was. And I thought what you were talking about in that piece is this guy comes to Harlem and he's trying to dress Harlem up. Yes. Harlem's fine. Harlem yes. food is totally fine. I saw you check in Laundell's, which yeah. Laundell's is, is great. Amy Roosh. Like, yeah. you don't need to dress Harlem up to make no. Harlem presentable to the world. And I thought that said something about your whole aesthetic, you know, yeah. um, even like how you, how you do food, you know? Yeah, I feel like... Love is worth nothing to me if I have to change myself to get it from you. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, for Harlem, for me, for right. anybody. It's, so if we got to do all this to get people to come to Harlem, what are we doing? Yeah, now? if I'm faking the funk, it's not, you're not really, I'm not getting your love. I'm getting the vapors, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I feel like we have to be confident as, as immigrants and anyone of subculture we have to be confident in who we are, like the Ramones. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. whether it's punk rock, hip hop, um, you know, white Brooklyn right now. Like, white Brooklyn might as well be an immigrant community mm-hmm. in a funny way, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody understands right. urban beekeepers. Right. But, <laughs> 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 but like, you gotta, you gotta own it. Right. And, and, but that, that is one very telling thing about the power structure in America is that you know, white Brooklyn is able to proliferate because they have the power mm-hmm. being from dominant culture to proliferate. So mm-hmm. it's interesting. Like, white Brooklyn is a very interesting place to study and mm-hmm. see, like, power at work. Where are you living right now, if I may ask? Uh, Stye Town, the okay. white project. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 No, I live there because it's by the restaurant. Right, 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 yeah. right, right, right. Yeah, right. and there's a basketball court. Right, right, right. I mean, you know, um, one, one of the interesting things, just to, this is the last time I'm going to go back to this, but... Harlem has always struck me as an immigrant community. Yes, um, absolutely. A great deal of, of, of the black folks there are often from West Africa. They're from down south, you know, who came up. And so it, it, I was not surprised after looking at it and reading to you why you would be offended by the way, you know, this thing was dressed up to make it presentable. Yeah, and, and I thought that it was, um, I knew that people, there would be backlash because it's a, it's a person of Asian descent defending Native Harlem residents. It's a residents. really weird. It's a really it's weird very thing if you strange. look at it on a skin deep level. But yes. if you go a little deeper, you can see the kinship. It's very strange. But I, I hope that there's a day where, you know, if you look at the history of Chinese people, we aren't ethnic, we, we aren't ethnically one people. Right. There's Han Chinese, but, you know, China was a melting pot. Right. And, and we have no idea how to trace back, you know, beyond those dynasties. But I hope that there's one day where we can all speak about communities and neighborhoods that we care about and that we have a kinship with and that we love. Yeah. And, and I wanted to test people. I wanted to see if I spoke logically, if I had reasonable arguments, whether they would look past my face and listen. Well, you interview people too in the piece. That was the other thing. Yeah. You talked to other people. It wasn't yeah. just, you know, you stand in Ohio. Yeah, I had like Harlem residents and yeah. natives and things like that. So yeah, I, I brought other people in because to, to be honest, the sentiment I had was a sentiment that a lot of my friends from Harlem had been mm-hmm. talking to me about. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of, uh, it's the rules within a race, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't want to take another brother down. Right. So, right. and that's not, that was not my goal, but my thing was I didn't feel like that restaurant was furthering the neighborhood or right. the identity. Right. You know, this is, I, I think I saw you in a um, podcast and you were talking about uh, maybe going back to Taiwan as an older person and the beauty and unity of seeing everybody, you know, looking like you. Uh, I've often heard Jewish folks talk about going to Israel and feeling yes. sort of the same way, being surrounded. I know going to an African-American, historically black university, I felt the same way. Um, one difference, though, I'm, I'm doing, I've been blessed with the opportunity to do some teaching up at MIT this semester. A large percentage of MIT student population is Asian or Asian-American. And it was the first time that I had to face the fact that in America, I, I don't know what the population of Asian, Asian-Americans is, here in America, but it's relatively low compared to other populations, right, of minorities. Mm-hmm. And yet, when you're talking about China, and you're talking about Japan, you or Taiwan, you are actually talking about like billions of people and yeah. a large percentage, a disproportionate percentage of humanity. Yeah. And what you were saying is, when you went over, you realized I'm actually not the minority. Yeah. Most a, a disproportionate number of people look like me. Yeah. 
it was it was very strange because I realized that I had almost been kept in like an aquarium, mm. or 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 an exhibit. Like mm. I was the DC panda. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> because I look around, I'm like lions, tigers, bears. Like right. there's one panda, and we're all dying. Right. But then you go back to Taiwan and China, and you're like, mm, pandas is everywhere. <laughs> So it's a lot of pandas. Yeah, a lot of pandas, man. And and you know, so I went back there and I loved it. And that was a watershed moment for me to realize there are Asians in mountains, there's Asians in lakes, there's yeah. Asians unfortunately yeah. in Uggs and rollerblades. Right. And right. I was like, we could be anything we want to be. And so I came back to America really, really mentally free. Right. And um yeah, man, that was super liberating, and, and you definitely hit it on the nail. Like a lot of, I have friends when, because I, I went to a yeshiva that, that went on birthright, mm -hmm. and I went on Taiwanese birthright. They mm -hmm. call it study tour or love boat mm -hmm. because, you know, um, you go back and you see the country, mm -hmm. and it's life changing. Mm -hmm. It's really life changing to be kept in, in kind of like this exhibit all your life, not around that community, not around the culture that you come from, not around a country of people who look like you, and to one day like be released back. It's it's really crazy. So did you, like, did you feel like this urge to quote unquote represent, like was that like, has that always been on you and is that what you kind of lost when you were over there? Was it like the burden of I'm Asian and I'm representing, you know? Good question. I always had a burden to defend myself as an individual growing up. Mm -hmm. When I went over there, I came back and felt a burden to defend us as a group uh -huh. of like-minded individuals, uh -huh. um, people, you know, not like my, but people facing similar problems. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, to me, the definition of a community, I mean, the short form is people who have shared problems, mm -hmm. right? Your answers may not be the same, your methods may not be the same, but you're facing similar problems. Mm -hmm. um, after I wrote the book, that burden was lifted. Mm -hmm. Like, really, after I wrote the book, I mean, I wanted to write it at that moment, though. I wanted to write it. People ask, why would you write a memoir at the age of 29 or 30? Mm -hmm. And I told them, because that's lightning in a bottle. I'll never feel that way again. Yeah, yeah. I don't feel the same way today that I did a year ago before the book came out. Why did you want to write a book? Who want to write a book? Yeah, you know, I just felt that no one was telling our story this mm -hmm. way. There was, you know, the woman warrior. There's the Joy Luck Club. There's mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, but I couldn't relate to any of that. Mm -hmm. I, I was... Just like this character, and I told Chris, you know, why I wrote the book was it's like you play Street Fighter, mm -hmm. and like I unlocked a character writing that right, book. Right, right. Like now you have to play this character in the game. Right. And I felt like before I did it, that nobody knew that character existed. Do you think we'll get any? I, I hate to ask uh, you to be a spokesperson here. No, no, I'm not. I only speak for just like weird Asians okay. that look like this. Good, good. I love, <laughs> I love that. You're better than me. I embrace the spokesperson yeah. well. Speaking as a black person. Um, <laughs> but I, I wonder if you feel like we'll get any better in terms of our representations. Like, uh, you know, black folks, we always complain about not enough black folks in the movies, not enough black folks on network TV, um, until you start thinking about other minorities and you realize how bad it really could get. Do you think we'll get better in terms of our representations in pop culture? I absolutely think it's getting better. Um, you see... It's even funny little things like Gundam style, right? Like mm -hmm. that guy, right. that Korean character, it's like, what is right. this? Right. You know, and so, so that's... So does that make you feel good or do you feel like folks are appropriating? Do you feel like stop biting or... or? You're absolutely... Like that one, on that one, I was like, oh man, this is going to be like a YouTube novelty sensation and people yeah. want to understand. But I was actually very impressed with the way people grappled mm -hmm. with the lyrics that he was talking about because he was mm -hmm. talking about an affluent society, almost mm -hmm. like the hills in Korea. Right. And that was what the song was about. Jeremy Lin was somebody that like really needed to come around, right? right? right, right. You know, that kind of like Jesus-loving Taiwanese kid, like we right. all went to Chinese school with him. Right. And whether we agree or not, like he had to be, he had to be a represented. Right. I, I don't necessarily want people to come speak for all of us. I want all the weirdos in the village to stand up. Yeah. I just want to see everybody stand up. And it's funny because we overlay our own stereotypes uh, onto other people. Oh, yeah. Not to you know, put anybody down here, but David Brooks wrote this infamous column a few, when Jeremy Lin was you know, really hot here in New York. And they said, Jeremy Lin is different because he's a Christian athlete. And it's like, dude, have you ever watched basketball? You've never heard of A.C. Green? Yeah, no, for real. But because he was so different, yeah. you know what I mean? 
his religiosity stood out yeah. in a way that all these big only blocks. virgin in the NBA, AC right. Green. Right, that exactly. was insane. Exactly, and he exactly. played with, like, with on the Lakers, so that was just right. insane. Right. And they're champions. <laughs> they're champions. He was in the Showtime Lakers. That was yeah. yeah, that was crazy. And I mean, even when they talk, yeah, that article is funny because at that same moment, you had Tebow and Jeremy Lin right. in New York at the same time. Right. I was like, they may form like Voltron. Right, 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 right. That's crazy. <laughs> um, we are. Uh, Quickly uh, losing seconds here. Uh, Eddie, where are you eating? How about that? Where are you eating? You know, I, I like the classic restaurants. You know, I like Luger's. Mm-hmm. I like Rayo's. I like the classic. I like Il Cantonori in, in the East Village. Um, I eat at Little Poland on 2nd Avenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll eat at Bauhaus. I mean, I never get sick of it. Uh, Nam Wa for dim sum. I'll go to Oriental Garden in Chinatown. Mm-hmm. Nanshang Shaolong Bao in Flushing, the mm-hmm. best Shaolong Bao. Mm-hmm. Uh, soup dumplings. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and uh, Malacan in the Heights. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Jewish, Italian, Cantonese food in New York is unstoppable. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Eddie Wong.